Okay, everybody, um, great to have you once again for our LAC seminar. Um, I'm here to introduce Wendy Applequest, our, our speaker. Wendy is an Illinois native who attended the University of Illinois. He played a PhD in plant systematics at Iowa State University and has been working at the Missouri Botanical Garden since 2000. She is an associate scientist in the William L. Brown Center, the garden's economic, botany, and ethnobotany department. Her research interests include, include, include medicinal plants, nomenclature, and the taxonomy of the flora of Madagascar, which she'll be telling us about today. So with that, let's welcome Wendy. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, my topic today is the salicaceae of Madagascar and the implications of taxonomic studies for conservation. So I'd like to begin by giving you a little bit of background on both salicaceae and Madagascar. Uh, if you're my age or older, you were raised to think of salicaceae, I guess that's almost none of you. <laughs> you were raised to think of salicaceae as salix and populus, the willows and the poplars, uh, species that are um, wind pollinated, have reduced flowers without perianths and catkins. Um, they're uh, generally dioecious and interestingly some Chinese uh, geneticists I'm working with have, have discovered that uh, there's two different sex chromosome systems in Salix alone so that's evolved twice within that that one genus uh, but sal salicaceae now also involve uh, a whole lot more genera that used to be placed in Flachordiaceae, a family that we did not have in the United States because it was kind of used as a dumping ground uh, for any uh, tropical species with fair, uh, tropical genus with fairly small uh, flowers uh, without fused perianths that weren't conspicuously members of some other family used to just get shoved into Flachordiaceae. So there were a number of uh, phylogenetic studies that proved that this was untenable. In both of these phylogenies, the blue bar here is the traditional salication. So this is Chase et al. 2002. Uh, the title of this paper was When in Doubt, Put It in Flacordiation. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of this other stuff, these were former Flacordiation, but others were part of this group at all. And, and so the Discolics group those have to go somewhere else. Uh, Mac Alford, uh, in a PhD dissertation, uh, used a lot more representation. Here's Salicaceae again. Uh, here's uh, a lot of the Malagasy genera come out in this group. Um, these are largely uh, neotropical. And he suggested that the Salicaceae since you chase that out, might be broken down into two families, the Salicaceae and Samidaceae. Um, the whole group is well supported as monophyletic, but they differ in having theoid versus thalicoid weak teeth and some other characteristics. So here we've got Cassiaria, Samida, and others that have uh, pellucid dots in the leaves, theoid leaf teeth, uh, up here, extors, anther, dehiscence. And uh, the loss of seed arils. Uh, uh, salicoid leaf teeth are marked uh, because they appear at several spots. And the, the uh, analysis indicated that they've evolved several different times. That's one of those things in which I don't kind of believe parsimony because it seems to me easier to lose the teeth repeatedly than to evolve the same kind of teeth repeatedly. But in any case, uh, there's there's two well-supported groups and a one family or a two family classification either way would be acceptable. So Madagascar, uh, as probably all of you know, is a biological hotspot. It's a, a large island off the east coast of Africa, formerly attached to it and separating about 90 million years ago. Before that, it was part of Gondwana land, the supercontinent. Uh, it's got a very diverse flora. The estimates are about 14,000 species. 
over 90% endemic. Uh, many, many species are endangered because a huge proportion of the uh, natural vegetation is gone, as you may surmise from uh, this map showing a satellite image. Now, a lot of the stuff that's brown uh, wasn't forest to begin with, possibly. It used to be assumed that the central highlands were forested, but some of them may have been grassland. Still, it's now largely a human modified landscape wherever things are flat. And this is a very poor nation and droughts and typhoons have recently made the situation worse. Um, in, the south, in the Southwest, people actually starve. People starve to death in Madagascar. And so when we consider conservation measures, that's something that has to be taken into account. Uh, the colonial history is relevant to botany. Uh, both the United Kingdom and France uh, were early colonizers of Madagascar, which before that had been uh, occupied for a couple thousand years by people coming both from Malaysia and then from Africa to the West. Um, the French wound up the colonial overlords for a long time, and much of the early botany was done under a French colonial administration. So that most of the material went to Paris. Uh, the uh, central highland here, this doesn't fully show the altitudinal range very well, but uh, it's low around the coasts, and there's this central highland that'll be 1,000 to 1,500 meters, and there are some of the seeps that go over two thousand meters and the prevailing wind comes from the east so you all know about the rain shadow phenomenon the rain gets dumped on the low lying east coast up to the mid elevation humid rainforest then the most of the central plateau is subhumid it'll rain every day about 2 a.m 2 p.m it seems like and then the west is uh, dry and the the southwest is very dry. And there are also a bunch of different soil types. So you get a lot of different habitats, particularly in the north, things are very complicated. So you have huge diversity with many species locally endemic uh, found in only a very small portion of the country. So uh, there are 10 genera of of Salicaceae is now defined in Madagascar. Yeah. Uh, Perry de Labathi and Sloimer, Herman Sloimer, both treated the genera that were classified in, in uh, Flacordiaceae. They didn't deal with Salix. There are putatively two Salix species in Madagascar known only from a couple of very early collections from the Central Highlands. Then Flacordia, there are a couple of species. Uh, we now know that neither of them is endemic, mm -hmm. as far as we know of. Uh, Cassiaria, which is the one genus of possible Samidaceae here. Mm -hmm. uh, Perrier recognized five species and some infraspecies in his Florida Madagascar treatment in the 1946. Mm -hmm. Sloimer lumped all those into one species, divided into two varieties, Cassiera and Igressens. Mm -hmm. Now the question marks, you know, chest notation, um, where one question mark means uh, that wasn't a very good move, and two question marks mean he really bleeped up. <laughs> this gets three question marks, <laughs> and you'll see why in a couple of minutes. I'll show you pictures of all of these things. Tissonia, an endemic genus, went from 10 species in the 40s to 15 species in the 1970s. Scalopia from 9 to 13. Ludia from 5 to 23, a big jump. Bavinia has just one species. Calantica went from 5 to 7. Homolium, a non-endemic species, a pan genus, sorry, a pantropical genus that's very diverse, went only from 34 to 36 species, although with some rearrangements and lumping. Uh, the endemic Bambitia, only one species was recognized by Perrier. Sloimer doing revisions of larger groups didn't treat it. Uh, so we assume that he would have thought there was one species. Um, the French botanist René Caperon uh, labeled another in a herbarium, but he didn't get around to publishing it before he died. So um, 
try not to drop that. Uh, so the total count of species went from 74 in the 40s to 99, or uh, if you take uh, chaperone species into account, 100 mm -hmm. in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Now, in the early 1980s, the Missouri Botanical Garden found out that basically this was a very key spot and there was one botanist at the herbarium in Simbazaz trying to do his best for his country all by himself and proposed to uh, to come and, and help out, start a program there, start training people. Uh, I think most of the botanists in Madagascar now are Missouri Botanical Garden trained and we have the biggest program there with dozens of botanists. And the result of that is that, uh, and, and other people's work, of course, also is that the amount of material available in herbaria has doubled or tripled since the 1970s. And frequently, uh, the Missouri Botanical Garden botanists from Tana are going to different places than the French botanists went to. So there's reason to believe that this count of species is very uh, obsolete. So I want to take a few minutes to talk about the taxonomic revisionary process for those of you who are geneticists and think that all we have to do is just point the tricorder at things now and it'll tell us what species they are. It's, it's not that simple. Uh, plant species have always been defined by morphological characters and species aren't real things, right? You often have these hybrid zones among species and where you draw those lines is to some extent a matter of opinion, but we can't just go and give every single individual plant a name. So we have to classify things so that we are able to talk about them. Uh, there have been various attempts to propose genetic or phylogenetic species concepts, but the weird and wonderful variety of reproductive systems plants use means that any of those concepts, if, tr if you tried to apply them across the entire plant kingdom, would be disastrous. So uh, what we basically use in botany is the taxonomic species concept, which means that if you have a group of species that has a certain number of fixed morphological differences from other groups of populations, typically three fixed morphological differences, you consider that to be worthy of recognition at the species level. So molecular tools are great. I'm sure you've seen those studies where people have taken um, dozens of plants from each population and they, you know, the, the studies where they have little colored bars for every individual and the, the distribution of color within that bar shows the genetic background of each one and the, the uh, computer can tell you exactly how many separate reproductively isolated populations there are. Well, th those are neat when you can do them, but it doesn't work for the taxonomy of flora of Madagascar. <laughs> um, maybe you have two or three specimens of a species, or maybe you have just one, and you're not going to get that kind of DNA quality out of it. And if it's the type, Paris is not going to let you break a leaf off to try. And the forest in which it was collected has now been cut down. So going and getting 20 more individuals, even if you had infinite money and permits, just wouldn't be an option. So if you want to know if that's a species, possibly critically endangered or extinct, but still a species, the only thing you can do is to stack it up next to other kinds of plants in the same group and physically look at them and say, do they look different? So that's that's how we do taxonomic revisions in the herbarium. So I got involved in Salakashi doing collaborative work with two of my colleagues, George Schatz and Pete Phillipson, who had far, far more experience than I did working in Madagascar, although I'd done a couple of of uh, revisions of various groups at that point. They got me interested in Salakashi. So Kalantica, uh, they, they noted that Salakashi needed work and Kalantica is a relative of Himalayan. I suspect it will someday prove to be embedded within part of Himalayan. 
uh, and it's got two perianth florals and uh, a fully secure ovary stamens, single foreign fascicles, and large single sepal glands. So with this uh, perianth open, you can really see those glands. These are not big flowers, they're like this big. But if you put them under a microscope, they're really beautiful. The glands can be intricately patterned. It's, it's a nice genus, I really like it. So we did a synoptic revision and described three new species. Uh, we also worked on Scalopia. It's rather more distantly related. It's got numerous stamens, small glands on the disc. Um, it's a widespread genus in the old world tropics. And in Madagascar, you have both humid forest species that have nice big leaves and uh, dry forest species or bush species that have small leaves and small inflorescences and thorns. So uh, we recognized 14 species. Only one of those was new, but we corrected some errors by Sloimer. Uh, homolium is where things get uh, kind of hairy. I started working on homolium then. It's like Calantica, but the, uh, the flowers have a semi-inferior ovary. Uh, there are 10 sections, and as I recognize those sections, there are six in Madagascar, of which five are endemic. So while Madagascar doesn't have a, an absolute majority of the species worldwide, it does have a huge proportion of the diversity that's making this possibly the center of origin of the group, and certainly one of the main centers of diversity with both of the major lineages involved. So I recognize 64 species. And uh, Anna Wassel, who uh, was the lead author on one of those studies, is, is here. And uh, uh, we described uh, 26 uh, species as newer elevated from species intraspecific ranks. So almost half of these are new. And this is just an example of uh, the floral diversity in Himalayan. Um, uh, you have a crescent sepals, a crescent petals, huge bracts, tiny little reduced flowers, uh, these things with very long, strong uh, cilia, uh, all kinds of differences. And then there's Cassiaria, and this is again the one genus that might be placed in Samadeshi. Uh, you can see that fleshy red arrow on the fruit. Uh, these species are ecologically important because the fruits are large enough to serve as food for birds and lemurs, uh, of which Madagascar has plenty. And again, many of them are, are also endangered. Mm -hmm. So Slimer lumped all of the uh, Cassiaria of Madagascar into one species. Mm -hmm. And I've been setting REU students to work on this research experiences for undergraduate students. And so far they have uh, described three new species and there's a fourth in prep this year, raised three more to species level from a varietal status and there's more to come. So here's, here's the example here. Now Slimer, uh, this is an illustration of a few of the taxa from Perrier's 1946 uh, treatment and then types of one more species and one of the varieties. So. So all of these things, according to Slimer, were in one species. And that's pretty plainly ridiculous. And Slimer was Dutch. And the Dutch tended to be lumpers and tended to emphasize floral characters. So these are all in section Cassie area. The flowers all look pretty much alike. They're tiny. They don't have a lot of features. And so he said, well, we're just going to call everything Cassier and Nigrescent. And you know, we're up to we're up to 11 and counting. Uh, Bambitia is interesting because it has a catkin inflorescence. It's got one or more flowers. Uh, they have small erect perianths, but they do have perianths, but each flower or group is subtended by several pairs of brats, sort of reminiscent of of the, the regular salicaceae. And I mentioned only one species has been formally described. Another uh, REU student did a bunch of work on this and is now waiting for me to sort out some of the hairy problems. There are at least eight species, maybe 10, 
a lot of difference. And unless you think, wow, we must be really radical splitters, we must be you know, just describing everything as new, that is not the case. Some of these are wildly different. Some of these are big leaves, big hairy leaves, big glabrous leaves known from one species each or one specimen each. Uh, there's tiny little leaves. There's a bunch of those. There's, there's a lot of difference here. Um, many, many characters. It's not like Cassiaria where there are no reproductive characters either. There's a lot of characters. It's just nobody had looked at the thing before. Uh, Ludia is similar to Scalopia with numerous stamens, but without petals. Uh, I have not looked at this yet. Um, it's endemic to Madagascar, except for one species. And like Scalopia, there are both thorny little dry species and large leaved humid species. Slimer recognized 16 new species in 1972, but that doesn't mean that no new species have been collected since. Uh, the International Cooperative Biodiversity Group program uh, in the early 2000s found a new species from the extreme Northeast in Guimar, which they named Ludia craigiana, um, but uh, they, they weren't trying to revise Ludia when they did that. They were only trying to put a name on this thing that they had collected for the purpose of scientific study and a drug discovery program. So they weren't trying to claim that there were no other taxonomic problems left in Ludia, and I would suspect very much that there are. Uh, then there's Tissonia. Now, Tissonia is remarkable for its three highly accrescent sepals, which enclose the rest of the flower. And the, the petals are either absent or also trimerous. So the brightly colored things you see there are sepals. Sloimer only did a synoptic revision recognizing 15 species. Someone working with the Madagascar Catalog Project, which is, again, an MBG staff project, estimates 21 species of which eight are unpublished. And then there's Salix. Um, Salix was described from two species from early collections in the Central Highlands. Uh, now there are very few willow species in the Southern Hemisphere. There's at least one in South America, there's a, a handful in Africa, and then introductions. Um, so there may be some reason for suspicion that this was, these were things that someone had brought in early on a boat and then got planted and then escaped for a while but did not survive. Uh, there's very little uh, forest left in the Central Highlands, almost none. It's heavily rice cultivated in this area. So so if these are native endemic species, they are critically endangered or else extinct. So some Salix experts should really be taking a look at them. And then there's Flacordia, um, only two non-indigenous non species. And Bibinia, there's only one species. It's widespread. It's uh, somewhat variable, but there's no obvious indication that there are multiple distinct species in it. So when you add together all those things, in this case, uh, the uh, the red is a carryover. The, the purple text is uh, estimates from other sources. And then there's uh, the work that I and colleagues have done is in black type and then questionable things in brackets, things that I'm sure exist but that aren't yet published are bracketed. So if I count officially, officially there'll be a, a, about 141. Um, but in fact, there are at least 160 and that counts only things that I or my colleague who worked on the Tissonia estimate are pretty sure of it, does not assume that there will be any new species described in Ludia. So uh, it has now um, more than doubled from Perrier de Labati's last full treatment. So the obvious question, given Madagascar's environmental problems, is how many of these about 160 species are at immediate risk of extinction? Um, globally, most people estimate conservation status by IUCN red list methods. And the methods uh, 
try to assemble as many facts as possible about a species. Uh, you can you can be at the bottom. You can be not evaluated. You can be data deficient. Mm -hmm. uh, a species that's of least concern is one that's considered widespread and safe enough to be uh, unlikely to go extinct. There are three categories of threatened. There's vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. Mm -hmm. uh, then they're also extinct or extinct in the wild. And there's a near threatened category for things that don't fit the formal criteria for threatened, but any fool can see that they are. <laughs> so, so you say, well, they're almost there. <laughs> And there's this complex, uh, you, the, the online you can get a hundred page PDF telling you how to apply these criteria. There are, there are five major uh, types of criteria that can be used to assign threatened ranks. And uh, many of these things are really intended to apply to parrots or giraffes or something like that and assume that you, you know how many individuals there are and, and how the population is fluctuating and all of that. And if what you're doing is looking at, at uh, plants in the herbarium, you, you aren't going to have that kind of information. So there are two categories that we primarily use for plants. Uh, the the B, sorry, that was inevitable. Uh, the B criterion uh, requires a limited extent of occurrence or area of occupancy and at least two of three other conditions. Um, a limited number of locations or fragmented habitat, uh, extreme fluctuations in the extent of occurrence, area of occupancy, et cetera, and you can, you'll, you'll rarely notice that. Or a continually observed, estimated, inferred, or projected decline in any of these things. Extent of occurrence, area of occupancy, quality of habitat, number of locations, or number of individuals. Um, uh, quality and extent of habitat is the easiest. So uh, when, when uh, IUCN uses the word location. It doesn't mean what any human being would mean when they say location, uh, because you know if you've got uh, let's say an endangered species that has five locations and an area of, of of occupancy, and that's defined by its appearance in a predefined set of two kilometer by two kilometer grid squares. Uh, so. For every grid square, there's a collection and you get four. And so uh, if you've got uh, an area of up to 500 square kilometers, any one of those locations might be 100 square kilometers. Obviously, that's not just a collecting site. What that means is a group of subpopulations that's potentially affected by the same threat. So let's say all of your collections come from one national forest. Um, if that forest was not protected, if people were logging around the edges, then you would say this forest is a single location. It is critically endangered by this threat. So it's an imminent risk of having a loss. You don't have to say that the whole forest will be lost. You only have to say that the habitat is declining in area and quality. And there's your critically endangered criterion. But if the forest is protected and no one is logging it, then there's no provable threat. So at that point, you can't apply that B criterion. And the only thing you can do is come down here and say, well, under the D criterion, because there's a very small area of occupancy or only one location, you can call it vulnerable. But if there were a second forest and there were a bunch of collecting sites within that second forest and the second forest was unprotected and was being logged, then you could say half of the habitat is endangered, is declining, and therefore it will qualify as endangered under the B criterion. So 
having more having the thing grow in more places means that it can be listed at a higher threat level. Uh, so sometimes it's a little bit irrational. And again, I think you know, they weren't really thinking about trees when they did this. They were thinking, thinking about parrots or something. Uh, but but this is what we have. It's we we can never have perfect knowledge, so we just do the best we can. So when you when you think about that, applying those criteria, geographic range is so important. How many places for the IUCN assessment, how many places does it grow in? How widespread is it? Area of, area of occupancy is those little grid cells. Extent of occurrence is, is the polygon that you draw around the points. Um, because if that's small, one thing, a fire, typhoon, whatever, could potentially take them out all at once. But if it's big, it means they're found over a large area. No one event is likely to hit them all very hard. So this is this is Herman Slimer's idea of where Cassiary and Nigrescence grows. Uh, variety of Nigrescence is a sort of thing that's all kinds of human things. The triangles are uh, variety of Sida. Um, and both of those have a huge lat latitudinal range. And you would say, even if a lot of those points are now on land that's got no vegetation left, still, these are obviously least concern. They grow everywhere. Uh, but the reality is something very different. Um, uh, in, both of these, in both of these varieties, there are multiple species, Perrier species, which are good species. And then um, those three... Uh, more highland varieties here that um, the most recent student, Angie Warren and Warfield Tuck, uh, raised species level. All of those are endangered because they are in limited areas and some of them are under grave, grave threat. Uh, two uh, Marquis Gates uh, picked out two new small weed species here and way up north. Uh, one of those is endangered, one of those is data and fish. Uh, and then Laurel Philpott described one down here, which is endangered. So, uh, in fact, there's there's multiple endangered species hiding within what Slimer would have said, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, here's another example from Hamalium. Uh, so Slimer put all of the material of, of section Rhodonisa, except for two red flowered species that were very distinctive, into Hamalium albiflorum. He actually lumped two formerly recognized species into that name. So all of those points there, he would have called Hamalium albiflorum. But actually, each little colored symbol is a distinct taxon. Um, ten, there's 10 species in that complex, and all of them have much narrower uh, habitat preferences than Slimer would have led you to believe, sometimes much narrower. And as my colleague Anna Wassel can tell you, within uh, section uh, Nisa, uh, Hamalium nudiflorum was in a similar state with several distinct taxa lumped in together because their, their flowers were similar. So this is my very crude attempt to estimate um, how many of the species are threatened. So some of these things in, in the right-hand column, I've got numbers for vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. And these do not include um, things that are near threatened. It doesn't include things that are data deficient, although I have marked plus one CR question mark for a couple of things that are known only for the type. Uh, those have been red list assessed as data deficient. Now, in, in our studies, we try to come up with unofficial status assessments, we look at these things, we look at, we calculate the area of occupancy and look up threats as best we can to estimate a provisional cons uh, conservation status. Uh, but to actually file this with IUCN, you have to come up with this huge dossier, you do it in much more detail. So we have a couple of Malagasy staff who do those assessments. 
and for the genre for which they've done them uh, that, that have revisions, um, I've used their mm -hmm. assessments. So Scalopia, Ludia, Calantica, mm -hmm. they say have eight, 16, and five uh, threatened species respectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, Ludia, we don't know. Um, Homolium, I'm using a combination of my assessments and theirs. Um, for, for Calantica and Scalopia, uh, they were a little more conservative than uh, George Schatz and I were in our uh, synoptic revision estimates. So, sorry. Um, but for Homolium, uh, they were uh, more liberal. Uh, they assessed more things as threatened than I had done in my revisionary treatments. Uh, and again, I'm going with them. Um, but the, there's a couple of things that, again, are data deficient, not sure of, and more work might cause those to be considered threatened. So Cassie area, right now we know that there are five, but there are going to be more. Uh, none of the four species that <laughs> remains to be discovered um, uh, are going to be widespread. Tisonia, I don't know, nobody's done anything with it. It would be silly to do red list assessments when you know that the species boundaries are a mess. Mm -hmm. So our staff in Madagascar haven't done any of that. Mm -hmm. Salix, if the Salicaceae are real, they're critically endangered if they're not extinct. Plecordia, nothing to worry about. Uh, Bivinia, nothing to worry about. Bambitia, I don't know, but at least a few of those are, uh, are going to be endangered. So just counting that up, I would say about 79 just from what we know now, but there are going to be more. There are going to be much, well, quite a few more, quite a few more than 79. So I've just said lots. Uh, so 79 out of 141 species described is over half. And uh, after this is over, it will still be more than half. Over half of the species are at real significant risk. So that's you know, one of the take home messages here is over half are threatened. And many of the threatened species are recently described. And sometimes that's because of failures by past taxonomists, but sometimes it's from newer material. Uh, the modern collections got to areas that the older collectors didn't get to. Uh, so older taxonomists just didn't have the opportunity to describe these species. Uh, species that are very widespread and that are very common are more likely to be collected early. So uh, if you think about the, the trajectory of collecting over time, uh, the, the species that are not collected until later are more likely to be rare and threatened species. And those genera that do not have modern revisions, the Ludia, the Tissonia, the Bembicia, although we're working on it, uh, you can pretty much count on it that those uh, treatments are inadequate for conservation purposes. And that does not apply only to Salicaceae, right? I don't want to leave the message that Salicaceae were a real mess, but it's a good thing they're working on that. Uh, no, a whole lot of things in Madagascar are a real mess. Uh, with a couple of colleagues, I'm starting work on a phylogeny of hypoestes, uh, uh, Acanthaceae here, and Emily and Michael know about this and are involved in it. Um, this is a, a group that uh, is, about a hundred known species, but there's quite a few more than that. It was last treated between the 20s and the early 60s. No full treatment was ever published. There are a lot of herbaceous acanthaceae, and uh, they were worked on last by this French colonial named Raymond Benoit, who died before he could write the flora of Madagascar treatment. So, uh, some of those groups have effectively not been looked at in a century. Uh, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on all of these little herbaceous things. I really wonder how much more time many of them have. So, so there's a lot of need to do this taxonomy. It's, 
it's very different from working in North America. If you're an, a North American botanist working on North American species, we understand really well what our flora is. And while we worry about endangered species, they're a relatively small proportion of the total. In Madagascar, the flora is still really inadequately known and a very high percentage of the species, both known and unknown, are at imminent risk. And that's the case not only in Madagascar, furthermore, but in many biodiverse tropical countries. So thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Wendy, for the fantastic talk. Um, my question was about your description of the IUCN red list and kind of the criteria that need to be met for a, for a plant species to become endangered or critically endangered, and how you mentioned that it's kind of not a system that's built for plants. So it seems very clear that there are a lot of plant species that they don't have enough data to kind of check those requirements. Um, but do you think that there's other issues with that system for plants? Like, it, in what you've done, do you think that like a plant being considered endangered means it's really more endangered than a species in a different taxa, or like is the issue just with the amount of data needed? Yeah, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, plant collections, plant collections um, are not randomly distributed, right? There's uh, there's this paper on the botanist effect where you seem to, you have a lot more collections and apparently more, more floristic diversity in the counties around a botanical garden or a university. <laughs> because, you know, if you're going out to collect for a few hours on a Saturday, you don't want to drive all the way to the far corner of the state. So, uh, people will collect along roads. The number of collectors who set out to bushwhack through the rainforest for a thousand miles like Michael Fay are small in comparison to the ones who will drive along the road and stop whenever they see something with flowers and get out. And, and the problem is that it, the areas that are hardest to get to are the least collected. Uh, so, for one thing, that means there are endemic species there that haven't been collected, haven't been described, but it also means that there are known species that are growing there, and maybe they grow all over the place, and if you went there, you could fill in 10 more grid cells with collections from there, but nobody's done that level of collection, so something can look like, oh, there's it only grows in two places, but nobody's actually collected all the places in between. It's uh, on the other hand, there's there's some value in considering these things proportionately. So if you have one species that's only found here and here, and then there's another species where you have 50 sheets and they're from all this area in between, then you can more confidently say, well, that one must really be endangered or it would have been collected like the other one wasn't collected. But how you would do that, um, rigorously and quantitatively, I don't know. I mean, our 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 knowledge is inherently limited, right? And even the people who are going out and, and looking at animal populations and trying to count how many individuals there are each year for years, they, they do the best they can, but there's no such thing as perfection, right? <laughs> More questions. I'm just wondering how unique you think Madagascar is, or do you think the same sort of things happen? How general general are your findings, do you think? Well, I hesitate to speak officially for places that I know nothing about, but I think. Um, I think about the Flora Milesiana area um, and the last treatment of Flacor Hiesi then for Flora Milesiana was done by Slimer in 1954. And 
Uh, I know that uh, in Malaysia, whole vast acreages are getting wiped out for palm oil plantations. And so a lot of plants are really threatened and, and animals, including orangutans. And uh, I'm sure the flora is very poorly known. Now, one of the issues with with the plants there is homoliums. They're uh, sometimes maybe only flower once every 15 or 20 years and that discourages people from collecting them. So there's very little herbarium material, but there's also uh, somewhat inadequate manpower to do the revisions of all the genera that haven't been revised in 70 or 80 or 90 years in the region. So uh, yes, I think, and Papua New Guinea, uh, there's Vietnam even, there are a lot of good botanists in Vietnam, but there's so much work to do there. There's so much work to do in so many places. Yeah. Hi, Wendy. Yeah. So I, I've seen these. I'm, I'm, my question is about sort of accuracy and collections, and and thinking about seeing seeing you know, it's, it's in some cases fifty years or more. From when a collection is made and when it's described, and you, you seem to be finding similar trends here. I I wonder if you could just speak to that a little bit out of your experience, and then and then maybe also to the fact that uh, small scale studies showing forty to fifty percent of tropical collections are misidentified. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you you know, what's the experience in South Casey along those lines? Uh -huh. I've seen quite a lot of things misidentified. Um, when I was, I got to spend at one point a month in Paris working primarily on homolium, and uh, I found uh, uh, quite a few bambitias called homolium. And I think, and they're very different. And I would just look at them under the microscope, and I was only after homoliums. So I wasn't interested in revising bambitia at that time. So I just say, what the heck, and throw them aside. <laughs> but <laughs> Um, I think the field collector said, oh, I know that tree, it's, it's, a uh, it's Salicaceae, and Salicaceae, that's that big genus Homolium, so he wrote down Homolium. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of, of erroneous field determinations, and what should happen is that a duplicate gets sent to some place where someone who's looked at the group before, looks at it carefully, puts a name on it, then that name gets sent back to the collector and that gets sent back to the herbaria that have duplicates. But, and and maybe uh, databases like GBIF will help that happen in future if eventually I see it and I determine it. The, you know, people will someday notice, but the, the curation of collections that's, that nobody is locally an expert in is limited, right? So if we've got a family from Madagascar and there's a, a family in debt, somebody put a family name on it, they said, I don't know what it is. It could be a new genus. It could be a perfectly common species that that collector just didn't have, happen to recognize. But if we don't have any experts in that family, we just jam it into the family in debt folder and think, well, you know, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, somebody will get to it if they have time. So yeah, and, and if there's a new genus 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, I'm sure someone will spot it, but there just aren't enough botanists to do all the work in a timely manner. You identify the large number of endangered and vulnerable species. So are there any prospects for trying to rescue them from extinction or it seems like an enormous amount of work would need to be done to yes yes uh hopefully uh, well the garden runs about a dozen conservation sites um and they have increasingly programs for their local tree nurseries uh, that employ local people to grow uh saplings uh, for reforestation projects of native threatened and endangered species. But of course, the number of, of threatened species is far greater than can be treated that way, even among the woody species. So 
they prioritize things that are really critically endangered, things that are taxonomically unique, say members of the endemic families, things that are culturally important, things that are ecologically important, feed the lemurs, that sort of thing. Um, you can't you can't save the world's species species by species. And I'm not a conservation biologist, so I'm opining on something that's really a little bit outside my lane, but basically you have to preserve the forest. You can't say, well, we're gonna let the forest be chopped down, but we're gonna preserve every one of those 150 trees in it. Uh, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, but if you can preserve the forest, then you'll preserve at least 100 of the trees just by them doing what they do. Great talk. Um, when I was working with some of the samples, I noticed a lot of the specimens have um, like the local people's common names for the plants. And I'm wondering if anyone has had the opportunity to kind of go back and collect more information on those local names and see how they map out on the newly described species. Hmm. Well. So you're talking about actually going and asking what what new species are called. You know that that's interesting. Um, I, I've wondered on occasion are common names pointers to taxonomy, and sometimes they can be, but sometimes they aren't. And uh, things that are really rare, the things that were only known from the type specimen, sometimes there's a name on that, but usually there isn't because the rarer something is, the less likely it is to have a common name. If it's really rare and local, it's probably not used a lot. And then there are a lot of common names that will be applied very widely and not always consistently. So you think about how we call a whole lot of things maple, uh, but we don't call the box elder maple, right? So, but a, a lot of different palmate venation gets called maple, right? Uh, and in some cases, it's even worse because uh, a lot of fiber plants are called hot in Madagascar. And uh, that includes a bunch of Dumbaya species, but there will also be different names. So this thing could be called Haft, or it could be called Hapamena, or Hapabella Foot, or blah, 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 blah. And there's this thing from a total other genus that's also called Haft, because it has nice fibrous bark that you can make cords out of. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like it's interesting, but it's not useful because because local people aren't interested in sorting out the species boundaries of what they have versus what people 100 miles away have. They're just interested in having a good name for this thing that we use. And I want to tell my kid to go collect some of. And it's really a, a different purpose. And so the there's no sort of policing that, like, <laughs> like in the United States, you know, pigweed versus uh, lambs quarters, right? So, you know, what, what does pigweed mean? It depends on whether you're in Illinois or Iowa. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Or we can um, join Wendy across the room for refreshments. And I guess with that, let's give her a, 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 a